So far, the top three candidates in the election are serving Senator Mondi Okwebolo of the APC, um, who is from somewhere in Irua, in a do central senatorial district. We also, okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, Tell us the rest. Uh, yes, uh, we have the technocrat, uh, Igor Dalo, as we uh, like to call him. Some say AI uh, mm -hmm. of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, who is from Ewohimi in Eastern South East Local Government Central uh, Senatorial District. And of course, the newcomer to Edo politics, a lawyer and former national president of the Nigeria Bar Association, uh, Akwata Olumide Anthony of the Labour Party, uh, LP, if you like, uh, from Edo South Senatorial District. You know, when people talk about um, where the candidates hail from, uh, this is one of it because uh, Lumidi Akwata happens to come from the same uh, senatorial district as the incumbent. And so this is where some of the dynamics uh, show up. Well, many eyes are certainly on a do state uh, governorship election and actions during the current campaigns. So who should deepen engagement with candidates? and their parties to prevent more violence ahead of the uh, September Edo governorship election. Well, we have some guests uh, joining us shortly to speak on these issues. And of course, it looks like uh, Victor has his mm. eyes on Edo. Uh, you know, you're talking about the central district of the, of the incumbent and that of uh, the Labour Party. It means uh, you have your eyes on Edo State. Uh, I, I should. I should. Because um, you're a neighbor. I, I schooled in Edo, not just um, <laughs> I, I schooled in Edo. I wedded in Edo State. I got my wife in Edo State. So. <laughs> wow, great. <laughs> so I have an in-law seated close to me. You're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Me and Ray John watching you live on the network service of the NTA. And I'm Victor, so thank you for joining us. Newspaper review will come later, but that will be after highlights of the news with Ogochukuka Ona. Good morning, Ogochukuka. Good morning, Henry, and good morning, Victor. Now, the morning news. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu of Nigeria presented efforts being taken by the Economic Community of West Africa to curb insecurity in West Africa. This comes as the mid-term meeting of the African Union concludes in Ghana. The declaration also reflects our will that we want to speak with one voice, the voice of Africa. And this uh, strengthens uh, further our position in the different international fora and meetings. And our Senate has inaugurated an ad hoc committee to investigate alleged acts of economic sabotage in the petroleum sector. Chaired by Senate leader, Opeyemi Bamidele, the committee seeks to identify and hold accountable those responsible for the criminal acts. They have undermined the investor confidence, distorted market operations, and exhibited our economic challenges. It is not just a financial issue. It is a matter of national security and national sovereignty. Minister of State Petroleum Resources Oil held a high-level meeting with key stakeholders to address and resolve the ongoing issues surrounding the Dangote refinery. A statement by Neamaka Okafo, Special Advisor, Media and Communication to the Minister, indicates that attendees at the meeting include Aliko Dangote, Chairman and CEO of Dangote Group, Farouk Ahmed, Authority Chief Executive of the Nigeria Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. Benga Kumolafe, Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission. Mele Kiari, Group Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited. Now, the National Council of Traditional Rulers of Nigeria meeting, and it is in solidarity with the efforts of the present administration. And traditional leaders across the country cautioned Nigerians to embrace dialogue rather than embarking on nationwide protests to address their plight. This formed part of the resolution of the National Council of Traditional Rulers of Nigeria when they met in Abuja to develop further solutions to ease economic hardship confronting Nigerians, especially at the grassroots.
And that's the morning news. Thank you so much for watching. And do stay tuned for the rest of the program after the break. Nigeria, a land of rich culture and diverse voices. Where every voice matters. In times of disagreement, let's choose dialogue over discord. Together, we can find solutions through understanding and respect. Let's build a stronger Nigeria, one conversation at a time. Dialogue, not protest. Unity, not division. Nigeria, united in dialogue. The federal government of Nigeria wants vandals of national assets, electricity transmission towers, cables and other facilities to desist from this act of sabotage. Vandalism is a serious crime punishable under the law. Vandalizing electrical equipments will affect millions of Nigerians including your loved ones. Remember that national assets belong to all of us, hence the need to protect them. Report all cases of suspicious movement around electrical facilities to security agencies. When you see something, say something. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and National Orientation in collaboration with the National Counter-Terrorism Center, NCTC, Office of the National Security Advisor. Did you know that a quarter of the world's deaths from malaria is in Nigeria? And the reason being a mosquito that spreads malaria, a disease that puts everyone's life in distress. We believe that protection and prevention is the best cure in the fight to end malaria. Mortein Insecticide with its improved formulation kills 100% mosquitoes that spread malaria. So spread the message of how we can fight to end malaria with Mortein. Mortein, our number one choice. The Council of Our Fathers. I will urge and advise our younger generation to use talent and brain to sort out problems, not uh, arms. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. We rise, a land of the free, we know the tire. We drink great, our spirit is undying. Resilient, rooted like palm tree. We swear in colors, we turn dark in demand. We met solutions with my passion, yeah. It's a destination, we have more than the solution. We are my I am the real Nigerian. Brought to you by the National Orientation Agency, NOA. All right, you're watching Good Morning Nigeria, live on the network service of the NTA. And up next is a newspaper review. All right, uh, we're set for the newspaper review because uh, Chukudio Kolubaja is uh, well seated and ready to roll. Yes, Victor. Good morning. We thank God, we thank Providence for being here. Good mm -hmm. morning. Good morning, Yeri. How are you doing? Very well, Chukudio. Good to see you. Good morning. Same here. All right, uh, let's uh, begin with uh, the lead stories on the front pages of uh, the papers that we have this morning. Uh, we'll begin with the blueprint uh, this morning, uh, which leads with 50% levy 
in 2024 amendment bill targets banks only. It's according to federal government and the National Assembly. The writer's decision may put future investments at risk, according to experts. CBN commercial banks appear before lawmakers today. All right, away from that, uh, we have NPA raked in 541 billion naira revenue, remitted 255 billion naira in six months. That's according to Bill Coco. And uh, quickly looking at the bottom of uh, the front page of the blueprint in the green strip, we have troops rescue another abducted Chibok school girl, He Abdo. That's on page 18. Uh, that's good. And we hope that uh, other girls would also be rescued. And uh, quickly uh, looking away now from the blueprint, just at the top of the, of the page, of, of the front page, we have Tinubu Monarchs, other leaders, caution on planned protest. All right. Let's see what the leadership holds. Uh, the front page of leadership has FG palliatives one week after. 21 states await truckloads of grains. Riders, Anambra, Okoibom, Boyosa, Kwara, Rivers take delivery. Labour asks Tinubu to dialogue with protest leaders. Yobi won't join protests, says Governor Buni. Details on page four of uh, the paper. And uh, we have uh, right here um, Chiba girl, of course, with pregnancy, two children rescued. Uh, this is a more detailed headline. Chiba girl with pregnancy, two children rescued, and that's on page seven. Of course, that's happening after almost uh, over 10 years of being in captivity. Uh, we have collapse, another 12 schools at risk in Jos. That's according to the governor. Of course, so that needs to be looked at. And then we have to Polo Lord's walls in Jack's appointment as head of service. Uh, that's uh, the much we can take. But there's this interesting picture here on the front page of the leadership. It's a picture of a migrant uh, resting on the sands after arriving in the fiber boat at Las Buras Beach in San Augustine on the islands of Gran Canaria in Spain. Not a good picture, of course. I'm sure those uh, planning to leave Nigeria would want to look at that and see what it can do to remain in Nigeria. Those who plan to leave Ill well, Illegally. irregularly. Yes. <laughs> All right. And um, Vanguard here has uh, quite uh, just a few stories. It leads with electricity. Why systems collapse won't end soon. That's according to an investigation. You find details of it on page five. And it says, the, the writers read, 10 factors fueling Nigeria's frequent system collapse. Frequency variation, lack of SCADA, others responsible, that's according to Power Up Nigeria. Hold TCN responsible for system collapse, that's according to experts. Businesses pay for services they do not enjoy, that's according to LCCI, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And finally, no economy can make progress without stable power. That's uh, attributed to CPPE. And then you have uh, a number of picture stories. One which has uh, the Minister of um, State Petroleum Resources, uh, Henneke Lokbobiri, um, businessman Aliko Angote, Mele Kiari, and the others, and is captioned resolving issues on Angote refinery. And finally, Dan Soho, takes over from Belokoko, that's uh, the change of guards at the Nigeria Ports Authority. Security forces issue stem warning to sit-at-home promoters. You find details on page 25. And before we drop this, Mr. and Mrs. Well, Mrs. says to Mr. Men are now afraid of making babies. How? <laughs> Why? And Mr. responds, what kind of babies do you think jollof rice made from three tiny tomatoes, four dried pepper, and one tiny bulb of onion will produce? I will answer him. They'll produce, <laughs> they'll produce no. babies whose heads are like a, a truckload of grain, <laughs> sitting on a very tiny body, like I. That, God, that's a third pool. <laughs> God, God, God forbid. <laughs> you didn't pass your biology. Come, we came here to, uh, to, to, to review newspapers. And here we go. <laughs> Electricity, why systems collapse, won't end. Mm. When you see some of these headlines, sometimes you don't want to read because it's becoming a recurring decimal. The tortoise says, hold my, uh, my hind foot. You, you go there, he said, no, I said my neck. You go to the neck, he says, no, I meant my fore, 
forum. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Ask yourself, from 1999 to 2024, check whether there's a radical increase in the in amount of megawatts we, we produce. Mm. It's a sorry, it's sorry story. So let's, let's get to work and stop this bug passing and all that. Uh, we, we are tired of li things True. being listed. True. Let there be light. Okay? Uh, a pity uh, that uh, the Chibok girls were taken on April 14, I think, 2014. That's mm -hmm. more than 10 years uh, from what Yere read. But we are happy that one more has been rescued. She has a three-month pregnancy. She came in with two, two ladies. Ehi, uh, uh, who? Yeah, uh, you sue for something? Okay. Well, the, na the name won't matter much. It doesn't story. matter. The lady has been rescued. But I was going through Google the other time. About 100 of them are still said to be, you know, unaccounted for. But they said something that saddened me. They said even those who have been rescued are treated by their communities as Boko Haram collaborators. If this is true, if this is true, that is sad. I don't think any of those girls ever uh, took a placard or put a, a, a banner on their forehead and said, please come and kidnap me. Mm. No. Mm -hmm. So such a situation should not arise at all. I hope it is inaccurate that what Google has there is inaccurate. Otherwise, that stigma is unfair. It mm -hmm. is uh, salt on injury, insult on injury, you know? It's, it's, it's not right. We must behave like uh, civilized people. I hear that uh, marketers are projecting 700 billion naira monthly subsidy. When our dear Kingsley was here, we said something. Why are some people crying on behalf of some people, taking Panadol for another man's headache? Government says <laughs> it's not subsidizing. If people are coming from the sides to talk about subsidy, I didn't even read the story fully, uh, I, I must confess. But I am not interested in Victor talking about Chukudi's maladies more than Chukudi who suffers those maladies. What is the intention? That's you want to, what you want to ask at the end of the day, you know? Mm -hmm. Then um, the Dangote, uh, you know, feud with the NMDPRA is unwarranted. People are arguing that... Um, since the uh, government did not take up its 20% stake in uh, Dangote, instead, uh, you know, dropped at 7.2% uh, or 7.5%. Mm. Please, let's get the accurate figures. It's been one story or, or another. It is not how it should be. Our own son, please, I'm one of those against vote for him is our son. It's one of the things killing Africa. But this time around, in terms of investment, our own son has put something on the soil here. For crying out loud, we should do all we can to support the effort. First of all, it is likely to give us um, lesser uh, co uh, fuel cost because uh, landing uh, fees are no longer going to be tenable. You're pulling crude from here and refining here. So freighting does not terribly take your funds. And I asked somebody the other day, you say, look, some of these IOCs, uh, they project uh, supplies very, uh, almost a year ahead and all that. I said, well, maybe that's part of the reason Dangote may be complaining about uh, not getting crude to refine. But if there was enough synergy between NNPCL and Dangote, we should have projected, right, projected properly right from when completion was, you know, getting closer and closer, maybe eight months to com completion. It's all inadequate planning. We should have planned properly so that immediately uh, the, the refinery came on stream, there would be, you know, a supply of raw materials, chief, of, uh, chief among which is uh, the crude. So I, I, I think it is something which should have been spared. But I thank God that the lawmakers are wading into it. They are going to eventually, you know, uh, 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 sort it all out. I, I was amused when I saw a, a, a rider buy me out. Dangote, of, you know, I think that's um, uh, that might contain a little sarcasm there. You don't, 
put that kind of investment on the ground and then just a little crisis everything and you say, has, take it if you want price. to. Yes. Everyone has a so, price. If you give him the money he's looking for, return good return on investment in such short a time, I'm sure he, he probably will be willing to Victor, let go. sometimes it, it is not money. Legacy. Yes. Right. When we were still doing O-level economics, there was such a thing as pride of ownership. Pride of ownership as one of the factors determining the location of industries. I think that's ridiculous, if not ludicrous. But it was terrible at a stage, you know. So that's that, that, that that's the bit I want to say about whatever it. the crisis is about. <coughs> I'm almost certain it's personal interest, because if it is national interest, everybody will be on one page. Hmm. V Victor. On national television, I don't want to deride my country, but let me tell you, part of the I, reason I Nigeria suffers is that many of us treat it as a goat that belongs to everybody. Nobody feeds it. So I don't know where this your patriotism and all that. If we were showing enough patriotism, Nigeria would not be where it is today. So I don't well, know how much we are really shoring up the pillars holding this great nation. We're saying nation. the same thing. <laughs> You know. All right, many thanks, uh, Chukudi. Uh, just a quick addition to what you said. Um, I just think that we should uh, commend the Nigerian military for the efforts they have been making recently in getting those that, are, um, um, that have been captured, yes. you know, to get them back, um, you know, to their families. Uh, besides the Chibo girl, uh, the Nigerian military actually rescued 330 it's, women and children it's, it's from great. the enclaves of Boko Haram terrorists in Zambisa Forest. Great and then handed them over to Borno State Government. They should be commended. Uh, they should uh, be given the necessary support, you know, to continue in this direction, just so that, um, because I'm just imagining the families of those who have their loved ones with Boko Haram, how yes. they feel, and how they will feel getting them back home. Yes. You know, I, it's not something you want to imagine, but I just think that we should commend those who are making this possible, you know, despite- I completely agree. Um, and do you know that by extension, the military, uh, the security forces are winning the war. It is a nowhere to run situation you're seeing now. That is why we are able to retrieve some of these, uh, you know, people who get ab abducted. The, 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 the hiding place is being exposed more and more. We pray that it continues that way. Nigeria does not deserve this at all. Well, true. All right. Thank we you, Chukudi. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank we'll you. see you again tomorrow. I, 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 I hope your, your, your thanks will warm me up. It's cold out there. No, just take a coffee. <laughs> yeah, take a cup of coffee. I will. We'll see you after the break. Thank you. Nigeria, a land of rich culture and diverse voices. Where every voice matters. In times of disagreement, let's choose dialogue over discord. Together, we can find solutions through understanding and respect. Let's build a stronger Nigeria, one conversation at a time. Dialogue, not protest. Unity, not division. Nigeria, united in dialogue. you would lie to about your whereabouts? My mom. My pastor. My girlfriend. Is your girlfriend here? My girlfriend is my job. Ah, brother, she never do. Ah, you are a criminal, brother. <laughs> she is a barrister and solicitor of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Come on! Come on. <laughs> I get lawyer. I get. I look what? You're looking yummy, yummy. Don't let me blush. She. I'm at work. <laughs> Name something people do in the bathroom. They sing. Wash their clothes. Do they do? Chevron! Nigeria means a lot to me. And Nigeria means peaceful cohesion. My country. Yeah, you continue to pray and then. Hopefully, we will come to understand that unity, unity of purpose, unity of living together. Our ethnic beliefs and background and culture is our strength. Ever since the amalgamation period of uh, 
1914 to date, about 109 years ago, the people of Nigeria live very peacefully with one another. I think diversity helps a lot to, uh, to enhance uh, robust development in Nigeria. All over the country, you know, you have so many ethnic groups, over 250. That is enough to tell you that this is a blessed country and, you know, uh, God has kept, you know, together as one individual entity. Football party, Go TV for correct goals and action. Ha! Sharply reconnect on top Go TV Max with 7,200 naira to touch like La Liga, Serie A, Europa, and select Premier League games live on top Super Sport. Go TV, love it. All right, this is Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA to kickstart our conversation. Let's get this background report by Dennis Temple. Elections are fundamental to democratic governance. That is why citizens choose their leaders and influence the direction of their affairs. However, election-related violence can undermine this process thereby leading to instability, loss of lives, and trust deficit. In the past, elections in Edo State, just like other parts of the country, have always been mired by violence, political thuggery, and ballot snatching. All these arise from contestations among political parties and their candidates. Since April this year, when ANEC announced that campaigns could begin ahead of the September governorship election, there is currently heightened tension in the Edo State. First, it was the Labour Party candidate, Olumide Abata, who cried out over possible breakdown of law and order in the state, following destruction of his campaign b-boards in some locations in the state. The b-boards of the PDP candidate, Asue Egodalo, and APC candidate, Monde Opebelo, were also being destroyed. Prior to these attacks on campaign b-boards, there were shooting incidents at some voters' registration centers during the continuous voter registration exercise conducted by ANEC in the state between May and June. Although there have been several consultations and dialogue between ANEC, security agencies, and political stakeholders in the state, violence continues to threaten the peaceful atmosphere needed for successful conduct of the election. The violence appears to have taken a dangerous dimension following last week's violent confrontation around the vicinity of Benin Airport, during which a policeman attached to the APC governorship candidate, Monde Uevelo, was killed. Uevelo and a deputy governor, Philip Shaibu, who was returning to the state after his reinstatement by a federal high court Abuja. Both were alleged to have escaped death by the whiskers, as the shooting lasted for hours. As Edo State approaches its governorship election, it is crucial to look at how to implement strategies that will ensure a peaceful and fair electoral process, education, and political awareness as well. Guests on Good Morning Nigeria are already seated in the studio and will give insight into the most practicable method for a violent-free Edo governorship election. All right, many thanks, uh, Dennis Temple, for the background report. Uh, let's uh, get into the discussion now, uh, looking at developments uh, in the build-up to the Edo governorship election scheduled for uh, September 21. And we have seated uh, with us here, GD Ujo, a public affairs analyst. Many thanks for joining us, sir. Good to have you. It's again. a pleasure, Larry. I like the way you look today. Thanks for the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> All right. While well, we expect some other guests, let's uh, welcome here in the studio 
Dr. Dikbo or Layoku, who is also a public affairs analyst. Uh, welcome to Good, good Morning, morning Nigeria. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. You ask good morning. Okay, let's uh, begin the conversation. Maybe I should start with uh, Jido Ojo. I, I don't know what you are seeing in your crystal ball. Uh, uh, what's your reading of the situation in Edo State at the moment? Thank you, Victor. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it has become a ritual ahead of every election, not just in Edo, but ahead of every election, whether it's by election or you are talking of off cycle election or general elections, for tension to rise and for election related violence to spike. And that's exactly what's happening ahead of the September 21. Uh, election in, in Edo State. And recall four years ago, it took the intervention of Oba Bini to call the gladiators to order. Uh, it, it was even worse than what we are currently experiencing now. Uh, but so far, um, there are 150 days for candidates to campaign, and I think there are about 17 or 18 candidates in Edo. Uh, so, the frontline candidates are about three, and they want to outdo each other. And that's what you are seeing. And violence is in threefold. Although many people look more at physical violence, there is what is also called psychological violence and uh, sociological violence, you know. So, uh, and all of these three are on the rise. Uh, when you look at the rhetorics, you know, of the political gladiators, that is psychological violence, you know, uh, the, the kind of a speech that is coming out, it's not physical. Nobody is exchanging blows, but it has potential to spark, to spark physical violence. So, it's, it's a psychological form of uh, uh, violence that, that is on the right. And we are going to see escalation uh, up until when the election is conducted on September 21. Because it's just in the nature and character of political gladiators to, to want to uh, uh, outdo each other in terms of uh, attention, in terms of... Um, uh, all manner of things. And, and you know, the, the, the mix in Edo, the mix in Edo is that two things are conflicting. One is the impeachment, purported impeachment of the deputy governor, the incumbent deputy governor, and the reinstatement. And his attempt to go and reclaim his seat. That is playing out. But it's a fallout of wanting to contest for this same seat with ticket which has been given to someone else. Mm -hmm. And we can see last Saturday <coughs> is defection to the uh, APC when he remains the deputy the governor. governor of PDP in government. So it, it's not a, 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 a government that is divided somewhat. And that in itself has caused a lot of uh, tension uh, within the state. But it's not unusual. And we have organizations like Kimpact Development Initiative, which are deployed uh, observers to track incidences of violence in Edo State. Uh, as, uh, they, they, they will be publishing their report on Friday uh, here in Abuja. But uh, the preview I've had is that, of course, there is a rise in the in the in the incidences of election related violence quite unfortunately it's now resulting into fatalities uh yes yeah like uh, dennis the temple police. reported yeah. the destruction of uh, b boards and all of that yes that 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 is happening but a, a situation like what happened was it on thursday or friday where an inspector of police uh, lost his life as a result of uh, you no know, power tussle uh, between the loyalists of the, the reinstated deputy governor and those purportedly in support of the state government. 
So you, we, 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 we see this, but it is for the police to rise up to the occasion and, and, and do all it could uh, to ensure that this does not go beyond, this does not snowball into uh, what will uh, uh, consume the state. Because I know that National Peace Commission, at some point ahead of the election, will still gather all the gladiators together to and come do, and, and sign the ritual. peace. <laughs> Is it peace accord or peace pact, which are more of, more or less observed in breach? But uh, we still look forward to the royal His Royal Highness, the Oba of Benin, uh, to, to, to intervene and no, but, call but talking about, the gladiators to order. Talking about the Royal Highness, uh, the Oba of Benin, intervening, do you think it's good uh, for the politics of that state? I ask that because I'm sure you've seen what has played out in this particular uh, campaign. Uh, people wanting to use uh, where, the, where they think the Oba is uh, you know, likely tilting towards uh, to, to discredit the other candidates. Do you think it's good for the politics of that state? Well, to the best of my knowledge, Oba of Bini has remained neutral. He's been the father of all. Uh, one of the candidates claimed that he's the son of the palace. And mm. the palace came out and said, no, <laughs> we don't have a son who is contesting in this election. No, so people will make all manner of claims. And then, of course, I'm sure you remember the case of the chiefs who attempted to take the Oba to, uh, to, to the court. And many people used that to say that it was a particular candidate who was instigating the chiefs against the Oba. So, I mean, all of this politics. Again, it's politics Nigeriana. Uh, you, you don't expect anything less in, in a highly competitive election. And, and you, you see, the peculiarity of this election in Edo is such that the incumbent is not on the ballot. So it's a free for all. It is a different ball game when the incumbent is, is on the ballot. It, but it, when it the incumbent has an anointed candidate? Well, he may have an anointed candidate, but because he is not on the, on the ballot, and again, you know, he, he has an anointed candidate, no doubt, but the other candidate also have an anointed father, <laughs> no, but, but <laughs> a governor should support his party's candidate. It's not about being an anointed or not. A governor should support the candidate. Exactly. Every politician does exactly. that. Exactly. If Every you belong to a political party, that. you should support the candidate of your political but, but, party. But, but, but Victor, <laughs> allegiances are even different. Uh, don't forget, Edo, particularly when you look at the political geography of Edo State, it's very interesting. The scenario is very interesting. PDP is in control of the state. But APC has a strong hold on Edo. Let me give you this instance. Out of the three senatorial districts, APC is controlling two. PDP is not controlling any. The, the Edo South is controlled by, a, 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 is represented by a Labour Party, Party. A, 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 a senator. So, you, and, and you see, as of reps, APC has more members of House of Reps than, than uh, PDP. Then State House of Assembly is, is also almost, uh, I don't know the configuration, but it tells you the story that it's, it's a straight fight. Uh, I don't want to say, I, I would say it's a three-horse race. It's a three-horse race, but because of the very competitive nature and like I said, when a, an incumbent is not running, it's a free for all. The advantage is less mm -hmm. than if an incumbent it, is, on the is, the, is on the ballot. He will, he will support the candidate of his party, no doubt. But he may not give but it his it, all. It, it, of course, because he knows that if he, if he abuse the, the if he misappropriate the fund of the state to bankroll the election of his anointed candidate. ESCC will come knocking after he loses his immunity. So he will have to use his number six to say, yes, I give you my support. I have limited resources to support you, but you are more, like, more or less on your All own. Right. All so right. let's, let's pause see how, you. how this whole thing will, will play, play out. out of course. Ultimately. Let's pause you a bit, uh, GD Ojo, and get to Dr. Olayo Kong uh, to find out what his perception of is of uh, the um, you know, a dual election and then the build up to rate. I also want to speak, I want you to speak concerning the issue of zoning, um, you know, and what you think uh, that would produce for the state. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I, I think uh, we'll be making a fatal mistake if we isolate the problem in Edo. 
like uh, it's a little just said that is the general configuration of Nigerian politics and let us say politics in Africa on the issue of uh, zoning <coughs> you have to look at the peculiarity of the Edo election because uh, you know initially many of the political parties said oh, they are not going to look at the issue of zoning but uh, at the end of the day they just have to give in to that because um, there are so many things you need to consider if you are going to zone do you zone to a minority senatorial district because you have to look at the politics it's a game of number mm -hmm. you need the numbers to win elections uh, and unfortunately in nigerian politics we don't look at issues that i will look at where is the person from is it my brother or my sister they don't want to look at that's why violence has taken over in the absence of discussion on issues because when you have a deficit in selling your ideas you resort to violence and that is why the problem in nigerian politics has to do with violence and then you also look at the issue of those people who have perpetrated violence in the past what happened to them is it not um, an irony that a police officer was killed on Thursday and by Saturday there was a ceremony where the deputy governor declared and if you look at the ceremony around that place you won't believe that just two or three days ago there were some casualties you understand my point mm. and then you look at the history of violence has anybody been seriously punished as a result of violence in politics in 2023 in Kano State, a city member of House of Representatives led talks to the headquarters of a political party and they burnt down the building with 13 living souls inside the house, the building that were that perished. As we speak today, the person is still sitting in the House of Representatives. So the issue of uh, violence in that 2023 has become history. So now go back to your, to your question of, because I just made a digression so that we look at the issue of violence. Can we put an end to it? It's going to be very difficult because there have not been any serious sanction to deal with the issue of those who perpetrated violence to get into office. And that will continue to be an encouragement. On the issue of zoning, like you have said, it's not going to play a very prominent role because you look at the calculation. People are now looking at oh, the area that has more local governments. Are you following my point? That is most likely any candidate from there is going to be the candidate that will emerge. Nobody is talking about the issues. Okay, what are you going to do? What are your antecedents? You have occupied this position before. What did you do? So if we are in trust with another position, what are you going to do? So I think those are the missing link which we need to focus on as we discuss issues of election. We, we should not emphasize on those mundane things but on the issue of what can you do? What have you been able to do? I, I used to tell people because how, even how many of the voters know these candidates, apart from the paparazzi or whatever you see on television, if you ask the voter, who are you going to vote for? He might not even know the name. It's a matter of, oh, this, this is where they say we should go to. And that is where we need to elevate discussions about politics and elections. Let voters be educated on what is going to be in it for us if we vote for you. Going by your antecedents, what have you been able to do? The position you have occupied before, what is the, the capacity? Do you have it? Those are the things we should be discussing, and we should not be get. Uh, we should not get. Uh, the, the, we should not drift toward the calculation permutation by position, or oh, because this zone has more uh, votes. Then let us look at uh, push our votes there our candidates there. So uh, I, th I think that is more important. The issue of if we give you our votes, what are you going to deliver? Are we going to see what they call benefit of the, the dividend of democracy? Or are you going to be <laughs> like Yoruba will say, Omawa Nyajoshi? So I, I think those are the issues that we should be discussing. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dick Olayoko. And uh, apologies earlier, uh, I didn't uh, quite indicate that your deputy ch uh, national chairman of the Inter-Party Advisory Council. Thank you very much for your comments so far.
Now let's get back to Jide uh, Ojo. What's your take on the popularity of the candidates? And I ask this because uh, sometimes if you bring unpopular candidates, some people have said it has a way of fueling violence because they see violence as the only way to make themselves relevant. But if candidates are truly, truly popular, um, the competition is more healthy, the people have, you know, a choice to make. So if looking at the three major parties that are there, the APC, the PDP, the LP, would you say that the candidates that they have thrown up are truly, truly popular candidates? Well, uh, sincerely speaking, I would say yes. Uh, they are popular. Among the Okwebolo of uh, APC, he's, he's a serving senator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a sitting senator. So you cannot claim that so for somebody to have emerged as a senator, uh, that is not popular. As for Godalo, yes, some people refer him to him as a foreigner <laughs> because they, they uh, say Lagos boy. I don't know when Lagos became a foreign land. Yeah. But, I mean, people, people can aspire and do and work elsewhere, but. I, I, I think since his emergence, uh, as well as his emergence, mm -hmm. he, he, has, he has been on ground and he has the full support of the PDP machinery within the state to, to back him up. Uh, so uh, then the, when you look at uh, Olumide Akwata, who is the Labour Party candidate, he has also shown uh, some clout. I don't know whether he's also a foreigner by virtue of the fact that I, I don't know whether he's no, at least chamber. At least he was um, uh, MBA president, which yeah, is No, big. no, no, no. A foreigner in the context that he wasn't based in Benin, you know. But I, I, I think that is part of the democracy. He wasn't strategy. a politician. Well, he's a politician. If he didn't pay politics, he wouldn't have been an MBA president. <laughs> it's politics that gave him that platform. And... and the, the issue of popularity, I, I, I think, in my own opinion, um, fame and popularity is a, is a, is a, uh, a variant of, it's a follow-up of so many things. You see, there are people we call dark horses, even in politics, people that are little known, people you may not even that don't have name recognition, that don't have face recognition. But when they have the party machinery behind them... Like the them, Labour candidates that won election. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, I learned it was a PA <laughs> to the person that he defeated, you know, at some point. I, I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, let, let me not go from that. The bottom line is that sometimes a dark horse can even emerge victorious because the dynamics of politics are very many. You know, Victor, there is something called protest votes. Mm -hmm. If there are gladiators, that's how uh, uh, Femi Otto, um, Michael Otodola became governor in, uh, in Lagos State in 1990, NRC. 1992 under NRC. Nobody gave him a chance. You put this old man. Because of the we, contest between but the, 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 the we, and Exactly. Uh, Adala Jobi and Sarumi and, and Sarumi, Edu. Yeah. You know, they couldn't just agree. And then when, when one was picked ahead of the other, the other said, hey, we will show you. <laughs> now we own this place. And people are engaged in protest vote. So I, I learned that's part of more or less what happened in Katsina in this last uh, 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 governorship election. I, 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 and somebody was trying to uh, tell me some background story about that. So sometimes a dark horse can even emerge victorious. The bottom line is what, how much of your party support do you have? Again, how much of resources do you have to market yourself? I did, a, I did an article a, 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 three weeks ago in my column in The Punch, and I looked at campaign finance, the nexus between campaign finance and corruption. And I listed all the things that you needed money for to be a prominent, a marketable, a sellable candidate. The, the legal and illegal expenses you have to run and so, if you are if if you are a minimum worker, a minimum wage earner, you cannot make impact in politics. That's why we are saying there are about eighteen candidates in Edo, but only three are frontline. 
But Labour Party proved that you can be a minimum wage earner and win an election in the last election. You uh, had Okada uh, riders that, winning that is, elections. That is an aberration. Let me tell you, it, it, what happened last year is as a result of obedient movement. And it also happened in 2015 because of the Buhari phenomenon. And it always happened when you have charismatic leader that you can lash on to their names and popularity to cost them to victory. But like I'm trying to explain, there are many variables result that, that, that will make... In the last election, it wasn't as if uh, uh, Pastor Ize Yamu that APC Fielder was not popular. Mm -hmm. But people said, I do not be Lagos. The fact that they perceived that Obaseki was mistreated by Oshomole as national chairman of APC to have denied him the ticket, they said, we will show you. Say you say you will not get a second time. We, the people of Edo, we will, we will make him win. And he won on popular sympathy. So sometimes sympathy wins you the vote. Sometimes your money wins you the vote. Sometimes your party machinery wins you the vote. But it's an admixture of several things that eventually will culminate in your victory. Uh, so it, it's, not a one, it's not a unilinear, one-track uh, road to victory for any candidate in any political adventure. You must just be ready to take risk. Every okay. good politician will tell you that if you are afraid to throw a dice, you will never throw six. Mm. So you must be a risk taker to win in an electoral contest. All right. Thank you, uh, Ojide Ojo. Uh, we have joining us now for this conversation, uh, Faith Nwadishi, the Executive Director, Center for Transparency and Advocacy. Many thanks for joining us, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, you heard uh, Ojide Ojo talk about, you know, what is playing out in Edo at the moment. We would like to find out your view uh, from your own uh, uh, um, a point where you... Uh, look at Edo State and what is uh, playing out at the moment and what you have seen uh, in previous elections. What's your take? Thank you very much. Uh, so um, what is playing out in Edo State is not really a surprise to me. I grew up in Edo. I studied in Edo. I went to secondary school, everything. So and I follow the politics and you know that the Edo politics is not different from what it used to be when it was Bendel. It was always opposition, very strong voice, especially when the citizens decide that this is what we are going to do. When Oshomole became governor in Edo State, even though you know it was Osumbo and then the court brought him, you saw the way people jubilated. Um, you saw the way people jubilated because of his um, victory, because that was what the people wanted. The Edo, uh, there, there's this maturity around politics in Edo state itself. So what you see happen is you have political leaders who prior to election unnecessarily try to heat up the polity, such that you see violence, you see uh, to, so that people will not come out on election day. So you see every election prior to election, there's this, you know, violence. But what is happening right now is taking it a, 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 a step uh, uh, higher uh, from what we saw happen with the uh, 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 deputy governor, uh, Philip Shaibu, now linking up with Toshomole. By the way, Philip Shaibu and Oshomole are from the same senatorial district. Anyway, I, I do not. Mm -hmm. And so you, you see the dynamics of that policy is coming up, especially as it's getting close to the, the election uh, period. So um, all that we have to say right now and tell the Edo people is the decision of who leads them is in their hands. Whatever is playing out now, at the end of the day, and I keep saying that every political circle, who does it benefit most is the politicians. So they will try to do everything possible to destabilize the environment and make it look as if the environment is not conducive for an election to happen. Because an election definitely will happen. The political parties already have their candidates. Unfortunately, the three frontliners who don't have a female candidate uh, there, like we always point out. But you see that the Edo people, especially the women, will come out irrespective well, of what is happening. Well, when you say come out, and then you said in previous elections, you have seen citizens decide what happens. 
if you look at the figures released by INEC at the end of elections, those who end up voting and, you know, the population of Edo State, it's actually just a few people. And of course, the issue of uh, vote buying, you know, it's big in yeah. Edo State. So is it really the people or the, or the political leaders determining who eventually wins election? Is the people, the political leaders are, are just um, a fraction of the population because whether we like it or not, even if you have like say two million uh, voters in a do state, and at the end of the day you have about a million people or a hundred thousand people come out to vote, the law says a simple majority. So that's why I'm saying that. Prior to the election, you will see heightened violence. You will see the narrative change, trying to ensure that people don't come out. And some of these things also impact on the population, the people that come out to vote eventually on uh, uh, on election day. For instance, if you look at some of those areas that uh, that you have prevalent violence, even on election day within the Benin City area, along along Sapley Road, along Teddy Secular, those places are places where you have a population, the concentration of people there but at the end of the day because of the violence that happens and for every election those places you see violence happening even on election day because they want to cow people they want to ensure that people don't come out to um, to vote so that's why I'm, I keep saying that the narrative going into the election is what determines the outcome of that election a lot of people become skeptical the issue of uh, voter apathy especially for a doe is because of the violence that happens before all of those uh, elections Elections. And because, again, people, the, the impunity, people don't get punished, people don't, um, people don't get, you know, reprimanded for what happens. So the last election, we visited some of the security agencies, the GSS and all of that. And the story is that because all of them have been together, they know what their plans are. You have this political party planning, this other political pl party planning. Now you have the deputy governor who is PDP, who has been PDP for long, has now gone into APC. You know, and all of the plans that they use to win elections definitely is going to lay those same plans for the APC and for the different groups and the Labour Party. There's no political party that is left aside when it comes to these issues of the vote buying. You saw the other time, the, the last election that held in the Edo State, where women were gathered in a room and they were giving rappers and they were collecting their voters' card from them. You know, those things are happening. But you see, those voters' card that you are collecting, you are not able to use them to vote. What you have done is that you have disenfranchised that person, you have collected the voters' card. Because right now, with the system we have in place, we no longer have the voter identity theft. Because you cannot use another person's voters' card. So what they do is they gather the women, they gather the youth, they give them small tokens, and they collect their PVCs and say, oh, we just want to make sure that you have PVCs so that on election day, you can come back to collect it. On election day, if you if you, if you you are living somewhere, let's say you are living in Sapir, Sap if you know, because I grew up in Benin City, so I know the, the territories everywhere around that, the politics and all of that. So if you're living somewhere, let's say you're living somewhere in Ikpeboka and you come, they're calling you to Oredo to come and pick this and they have collected your PVC. How do you find your way from Ikpeboka to Oredo to collect back your PVC on election day? You no longer have access to that PVC on election day. So you get that wrapper, the wrapper you use for whatever, you, how do, do, does it translate to the person who governs you at the end of the day? So there's so many intrigues about the politics, even before, um, like uh, uh, Jide said, uh, the sympathy with the present governor because of the fact that they felt that the um, uh, Shomole was oppressing him as the APC chairman at that time. But again, you remember the thing is that you have the three senatorial districts, you have the uh, uh, the, the traditional Edo people in the in the Benin area, Edo and then when you talk about that, when you talk, uh, that's Edo South, Edo, Edo, Edo South, Edo Central is the Asian people, and Edo North is where you have the sack of people yeah, where Oshomole, uh, Oshomole comes from. So the the the, the Benins feel that the, with the seat of the Oba in Edo South, you don't have somebody coming to oppress somebody who is traditionally from the Benin uh, speaking area. So that was part of the sentiments that uh, uh, went into the last uh, election. And that was why when uh, Pastor Isaiah moved from PDP and to APC, he didn't get that because they felt that it was a betrayal. But the, the, the long and short of all of this is is looking at the history of violence within Edo State, we see that it is a political class that keeps stirring up this violence. They're the ones who make the narrative around the violence. 
people should understand that they have the power to decide who is there and change that narrative about violence without being involved in it. But your mention of uh, the seat of the Obar of Benin, I already asked uh, GD that question, but I'd like to ask you again. Yes. Do you think that using that um, office of the Obar of Benin to play politics in that state is, is uh, a step in the right direction? Well, dem if, if you look at the democracy, it is not, uh, it's not good, but you need to look at the history of the people. You need to you need to situate the position of the Oba within the history of the Edo people itself. So you have a very strong traditional tool. It's like you're talking about the you're talking about uh, politics in Oshun State. Uh, saying that the office of the Oni of Ife shouldn't be brought into this conversation. They are traditional rulers. Ordinarily, because of democracy, because of civilization, they shouldn't be part of this. They shouldn't be part of this uh, uh, story. I, wa I want to remind you that in the first tenure, when the, the uh, uh, Baseki was uh, fielded as candidate in his first tenure, they went back to history to talk about the role that the Baseki played in the traditional Benin history, in the traditional Benin kingdom history. So these are kingdoms that have rich history, that have come and intertwined with politics, whether we like it or not. Well, the other can come out to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, doing this, I'm doing that. But the other's pro pronouncement in Edo among the Benin people is heard as law. So we need to find a way to be able to separate the traditional tool from politics. The beautiful thing about it is at the end of the day, anybody that emerges goes to pay homage to the Oba, signifying the fact that the Oba's tool is a very important tool. And I, I don't, I'm not uh, um, in support of state governors, for instance, looking at the, the rich history of the, uh, the, the seat of the Oba of Benin, interfering in that, because it plays a significant, it plays a significant role. And the people still understand that this is our tradition and we need to respect uh, um, that tool and, right. the play, and the role that it plays in our politics. Thank you. Thank you, Faith Wadishi. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, Yere hasn't asked her favorite question. So let me take it uh, to Dr. Layoko and ask if you are satisfied with the influence of women so far in this election. So that's your question. <laughs> has just, uh, made it's her favorite question. She <laughs> must ask. Engineer has just made reference to the fact that uh, none of the so-called frontliners have uh, any woman among them. And uh, I'm even looking at the issue of their, their deputy governorship candidates. Uh, and that's why what is happening in Benin, in Nedo State now, could be an advantage to the so-called underdog, just like uh, GD said, he took us down memory lane uh, to talk about uh, Lagos State and uh, Abala Jobi that made uh, Chief Michael Otedola to emerge. And that is why what is happening in uh, in uh, Edo State now could be an advantage because, you know, in, in, in politics, really, when you have election, 24 hours is like an eternity. Mm -hmm. We see about 57 days to go to the election. It's most likely that uh, the so-called other dog, because nobody is talking about uh, a candidate who has a deputy governorship candidate who is also a female. That is the candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party, Dr. Mm -hmm. Azemi. I, I think among the, politi the political parties, he seems to be the only one that has a the deputy governor who is a female. female yeah. I wouldn't know of any other anyway. So, that, that, but what that, about that, what about the, the voting strength? Of yeah, women. No, 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 no. That one is not there. It's never in contention. That any time you go to where they are casting votes, yeah, more you women. see mostly women are the ones that are there. Most of the time, the fathers are at home, either watching television or asking, what you're listening to radio to know what is happening at the polling booth. So, if right from the beginning, women have a prominent role to play. But unfortunately, when it comes to the giving them positions, we have not uh, succeeded in doing that. When they want to start campaign, they use women. They even hire separate buses <laughs> for women to follow them to campaign ground. <laughs> On the day of election, when you get to voting, putting, uh, vote, uh, voting votes, you find more women than men. Per but perhaps voting, that's because, like uh, Faith put it, <laughs> yeah. that they are the ones giving rappers, and then their voting power is gone. <laughs> no, 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 no. But they give men too. They give men uh, envelopes. Some of them, the men can even contain. Uh, they collect. Uh, Ghana must go. Because they are the men that will buy this uh, wrapper. So they, some people give them money to go and buy this wrapper. Uh, you, you see, it, that is why, unfortunately, 
maybe that is why our politics is still at this level. Mm -hmm. Because, like some of us have rightly observed, if we engage more women in political activities, the tendency is there that this violence that we are witnessing might not be there. That's why I said might not be there. Because the, 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 a woman having that uh, propensity to go for the violence is not there. Most of the time when you see guys that are engaged in violence, that politicians use to engage in violence, you hardly find women among them. So I, I think this is the time for Nigeria to actually open the door for women to come in and pay play more prominent role. So the question is, who is going to open the door? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alaya Okun. Uh, of course, I'm sure Jide Ojo will say the women should push down the door if, if they can't find the key uh, uh, and all of that. But I want you to speak around the judiciary. Of course, you'd give your response as regards women and their participation in elections, uh, not just for this do election. Uh, of course, um, generally, uh, you know, in the country, we've seen participation of women reducing and then just having to play minor roles, cooking and all of that, doing other uh, things that are not important to the uh, electoral process itself. But talk about the judiciary now. Um, we've seen uh, court uh, uh, judgments you know, in the build up to this election. Of course, uh, we saw the removal of uh, the deputy governor. Uh, we saw the party primary in the PDP, uh, the court judgments that have you know, emanated from all of that, and now the reinstatement of the deputy governor. How has this you know, shaped the process you know, before this election? Um, again, Unfortunately, the political class have bastardized our judiciary. They have dragged the judiciary into the political fray, which should not be. Uh, yes, court is for everybody to uh, ventilate their grievances and grievances. But I, I think the, the way the politicians have, have clogged our uh, court system uh, is a cause for worry, as far as I'm concerned. Just yesterday was as a uh, nomination reinstated. You know, a mm. court had nullified <laughs> his the nomination. Boundary. Yes. And if it's not a strong third person, that, that could demoralize you. Because I don't know how much they pay in PDP for nomination fee. And it's not just that. Look at the enormity of resources that he has spent on campaign, and the court said, uh, I think yeah, June 27, really you are not legally and properly nominated. So you start, you cease to be the candidate. But the party has, has, uh, has uh, rallied around and said, look, forget about this court ruling. We are going on appeal. And now the appeal has come, and it has been restated. And I, know, I can tell you for free, this will not end at the appellate court. Of course. It's going to Supreme Court. Now, look at the enormity of cases already at Supreme Court, at the Court of Appeal. Politicians will still go and crowd the dockets of our court. That is unhealthy for our democracy. I wish they could use alternative dispute resolution mechanism to resolve some of these things. Because... Every political cases that are brought have to be had expeditiously. No full way that is time bound. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what I'm saying? A, a, a civil case may have been in court for five years. A criminal case may have been in court for ten years. They keep uh, adjourning and adjourning. But when it's a election is September 21, if the court of appeal does not sit. To make a decision one way or the other, it can vitiate the chances of Aso Egodalo. And we have seen elections in Nigeria where Supreme Court decided on the candidature of the candidate after the election. election. And that's what happened to David Lyon in Bielsa. The candidacy of his running mate was not finalized until a day to his swearing in. That man is a lion hat. He's really a lion. <laughs> if I were be the one, maybe I would not be alive today. <laughs> Somebody that is already rehearsing for inauguration. And 12 noon, the court decided that yeah, you are, you, you, that is the other person that should be sunny. And that is the kind of damage that the political class has done to our judiciary. They have dragged they have congested our court system 
cases that should be adjudicated. I mean, uh, Dr. Layoku, I know him. He is a party chieftain. is the deputy chairman of Interparty Advisory Council. And I think that INEC having provided what is called alternative dispute resolution mechanism, that should have been, uh, ave the, the parties should avail themselves of this, rather than rushing to court. Every nomination is challenging court. It's not just this frontline candidate. Remember that uh, when, when, uh, when uh, APC also all conducted its primaries, about two or three people were laying claim to be the candidate. But they were able to find internal mechanism to bring closure to that. Recall that Dennis uh, Idaosa, who is now the running mate, was one of those who claim is the winner, or mm -hmm. one of those that were declared as the winner, winner. of that before eventually the they, have to, they have to go and do a supplementary, <laughs> supplementary primary, and uh, Monday uh, Okwebolo became the candidate. And you see that across. Look at Edo Ondo. The same thing. Uh, he took the pressure from the president, according to Senator Jimmy Ibrahim, for him to go and withdraw his case against uh, Governor Ayer Datiwa in the case of uh, every party. Prime. And that's why when the political class blame Heineck, oh, Heineck is doing a shoddy job. Heineck is not trying. Heineck is doing this. What, did they, what is the quality of their own party primaries that they conduct? If you do, if you do, the, if you do the, stats, the statistics of pre-election matters that go to court as a result of party nomination and post-election matters that go to court as a result of conduct of the election and the decisions of the court on both pre-election matters and post-election matters, you will see that INEC is doing a better job than many of the political parties. So we, we need to have an introspection. INEC already have a directorate or whether it's a unit called ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, which they can avail themselves rather than congesting it. Because this thing creates an atmosphere of uncertainty. Yeah. Like as it is with Aswe Godalu now, he will still be looking over his shoulder what the Supreme Court says. Because his traducers are not going to stop at the appellate court. Yes, he has won his victory back at the appellate court yesterday. But they will still drag him to Supreme Court, even if they know they, they, may, they may lose. They will just want to distract him mm -hmm. until the eve of the election. Well, and at the end of the day, you know, this is not healthy for our democracy. I agreed. You know what they say. I, I remember when the immediate past governor of Delta was um, aspiring to be governor. And I did have opportunity to ask him, I said, look, what they are saying, yes, Delta South, Delta Central have taken their turns. This is in the hearts of everybody, the turn of Delta North. But that you people are too many. Is there no way you guys can harmonize and uh, come up with more? And they told me, they said, look, there is no such unity that a people will say, okay, let us all rein in our own interests to be governor. Only you should go. Who is that person? You know, so that there's no such thing. When you say, oh, a party can be so united as, okay, all of you, nobody should contest. Everybody wants to be governor. You know, you say, don't go again. Let this person I go mean, for let us. Me, let me keep this in. So, Part of the reason that I know party leaders, particularly the frontline domin dominant parties, apologies to Dr. Olayoku, Every party mm -hmm. have equal status. <laughs> but the reason why some of the dominant parties charge high nomination fee is exactly to, to ensure Which that... To trim, to the, trim number the number of aspirants. Because I recall what uh, the former chairman of APC said when they, when they put the nomination fee for president at 100 million and governorship at 50 million. He said, look, if you don't put this eye, you have a, a floodgate of candidates that would be on, that would be difficult to manage. Some of them would be sponsored by the, some of some the of candidates. candidates. <laughs> so, because it's cheap, it's very easy. If it's 10, 10 million, they will just give like 10 people 
from the same district as the dominant candidate, go and contest so that they reduce the taxes. That's the part of the intrigues. And that's why the dominant parties charge high nomination fee, making sure that at least you will think twice that this is an investment that will be lost if you don't get the ticket there. It's not refundable. So you will think twice. But even at that, look at how many people contesting under APC. About 50 candidates still pay that 100 million. They, they still pay that 100 million. So it tells you the story of managing expectations and, and civil rights. It's the right of every, uh, every member of to a aspire. party to aspire. Mm -hmm. But you don't, the whole essence of having party primaries. It, and that's why in the, in the law, in the law books, in the electoral 2022, there's a provision for consensus. Consensus building means you reach out to others and, and plead with them and lobby them with whatever you want to do to make sure that the number becomes manageable. manageable. All right, Dr. Olayoko, uh, uh, I'm sure you listen to Dr. Um, uh, Gideojo, oh, you know. I, I, I said that. <laughs> Dr. Gideojo is fine. <laughs> I'm sure you listen to Dr. Gideojo, uh, chairman in waiting, uh, like I like I called him this morning. Um, talk about the issues in the political parties. We're seeing it play out. He's talking about the fact that INEC is doing a better job than what the political parties are doing. Uh, if you go to Edo State today, I'm not sure the political parties have um, a clear court manifesto of what they really want to do, and then uh, looking at what they've done in in the past. I mean, what is the challenge with political parties? And, and how do you think uh, you know, we can begin to straighten the political parties so they can, they can do what they should do in order to make our democracy better? Well, thank you very much. The, the rules are there. Because I make, uh, going by the power given to them by the Constitution, the Electoral Act, and other books, they, are, they have set the rules. For example, Dr. Gideon just mentioned the issue of primaries. There are rules for the primaries based on the constitution of the individual political party. And that is why it is mandatory if you go to section 82 of the Electoral Act. If you are having your primaries or you are having an election, whether to elect an executive of the party or members of your party that will run in an election, it is mandatory that INEC is there. If INEC is not there to witness, that means you have just done a family meeting. So INEC are, the INEC officials are there to make sure that one, you follow the Electoral Act, two, you follow the Constitution, and more importantly, the Constitution of your party. Because every party has its own constitution that spells out how their primaries will go. But unfortunately, because of the influence of some people in court who own the political party, either at the level of state, that is the governor, or at the level of the national, that is the president, you see political parties deliberately flouting their own law, their constitution. And that is why you see matters going to the court. That is, we have rules. I have paid my nomination fee, but unfortunately what we witnessed on the day of the primary did not conform with what we set out in our own law. But unfortunately, that is why there's a need, there, we need to find a way of solving the problem in the judiciary. Because judiciary, unfortunately, has made itself so open. It's like, okay, let me go to court. It's most likely I will get it. How I will get it, we don't want to go into it. That is why if the judiciary will be able to stick to the laws, you will notice that matters that go to the court will be minimized. Because if you know that, okay, you have run foul of the law and you still want to go to the judiciary because you think it's possible that we get it. The same thing with elections. That is why you see our tribunals crowded. Somebody that has lost election genuinely will still want to go to the judiciary. Because unfortunately, the judiciary has made itself like, oh, I am open to do business. So that is exactly where we need to tackle so it. Business centers. <laughs> <laughs> if judiciary comes out firmly to say anything short of the law, because you listen to some judgments from the tribunal, you marvel. You listen to some judgments at the court of appeal, you marvel. Let us take the case of Kano State in the last 2023 election as an example. 
The laws are very clear. The issue of nomination is predominantly a matter for the party. No outsider can come at, the Supreme Court gave the ruling. No outsider can come and question the nomination of a candidate for another party. Mm -hmm. But you still see some courts, lower than Supreme Court, giving ruling against what the Supreme Court has established. In the case of a uh, number of uh, ballot boxes, ballot papers, the laws are very clear that once the presiding officer says that this ballot paper, though not stamped nor signed, is from the booklet that I used on the day of election, that that ballot paper shall be counted and recorded in favor of the winner. Some people still went to court and tribunal ruled against what the Supreme Court has said. So if we want to get it right, the political parties can do their own. But once it is very clear that if you go to judiciary with any matter that is frivolous, you will lose. You will notice that matters going to judiciary will be reduced. So right. the parties have done their own. We need to rejig the judiciary so that they follow the laws, both by the party and the, the, the country and the Electoral Act. That right. is very, very key. Th thank you, Dr. Layoko. Now, we, we've gone into a lot of issues around the adult state election, from uh, women participation to, you know, uh, popularity of candidates and all of it. But the aim is to ensure that the violence that we are beginning to see in this election does not, you know, go ahead onto the elections proper. And so I'm asking Faith, how do you think we can mitigate violence going into the Edo State governorship election? Um, I, I think that um, what we urgently need to do is to ask the police to be assertive enough to ensure that um, culprits are brought to book. And you have to start with the big fish. There's no way you go looking out for the touts that are around the vicinity. You arrest them and say you have arrested people. Where meanwhile you have the ringleaders and you have not said you have not um, handled them. So it's important that when political parties hold their rallies, the kind of statements that they make, if they make inciting statements, it's enough to arrest whoever made that inciting statement. Because making inciting statements is a recipe for violence. So if if uh, you are castigating your opponent and you're not putting out facts, instead of you, you know speaking like you're uh, saying, if they want war, we are going to give them war, you should invite that person and tell, let the person describe for you what he means or she means by the war that he or she is going to bring to the arena. So if we are not doing such things, we are only... We're only adding fuel to those little statements that we think don't mean anything. There are people who are sitting down there who look up to these political leaders as mentors. So whatever those political leaders say is like, you know, holding out very sacred statements to them. So they will go back and do whatever they will have to do. So we also need to begin to have more town halls. We need to engage people. We need to engage community leaders. Engage also the traditional uh, the traditional setting because in Benin <coughs> tradition, the Edo state itself, it's tradition in itself. We must begin to engage these traditional institutions, you know, religious institutions, community groups, youth groups, women group. We need to engage them. It is true, like you, you we talked about the impact of women. Truly, if we engage women in in a more proactive way, in a way ab about bringing about uh, peace solutions, it will work more. The issue of vote buying didn't start today in Edo. There was one time I, 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 I observed the election in one of the interior communities in Edo. The women were standing there. You had two women uh, share one bottle of uh, Coke or one bottle of Fanta, you know, <laughs> on election day, even before we now started seeing them giving rappers and all of this. So it didn't start today. So, but for us to talk about the violence, Edo really is a peaceful state, but when it comes to elections, you begin to see all of these narratives from the political leaders. So we need ISIS, the inter... Uh, 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 the committee on elections interagency uh, uh, yes on, on elections security. you know we need the, we need that committee to be on board and you know for election security is the police so the police would have to have this consultative meeting with the other security agencies because even on election day you go out and you see uh, security agencies fighting uh, amongst themselves, fighting for supremacy. Who should be the one that will, uh, that will be the one to lead? Of, Who should uh, be the one to do that? So now, if we're already having this level of insecurity in a do state, 
there should be more uh, messages on peace. They should they should actually um, regulate the kind of statements that political uh, um, elites give during campaigns. And I'm saying as as part of recommendation that if anyone issues a statement such as trying to heat up the policies, such a person should be invited and be made public so that people who can begin to take you. It is not enough to say, oh, you saw some people, you arrest those people, and you, because you know they they don't have political weights. Those people, they, they can be dispensed. The political uh, leaders can dispense of them because they, they're just there to add to the number, not because they add uh, you know, to the value of what is happening. But when you arrest like a, a, a party chairman, for instance, or a candidate who has been spewing issues of violence on election day, I'm sure other people will take you. Take a cue. Thank you so much, uh, Faith Omadishi. I would uh, take a break now. When we come back, we continue the conversation. Stay with us. Nigeria, a land of rich culture and diverse voices, where every voice matters. In times of disagreement, let's choose dialogue over discord. Together, we can find solutions through understanding and respect. Let's build a stronger Nigeria, one conversation at a time. Dialogue, not protest. Unity not division. Nigeria, united in dialogue. The federal government of Nigeria wants vandals of national assets, electricity transmission towers, cables and other facilities to desist from this act of sabotage. Vandalism is a serious crime punishable under the law. Vandalizing electrical equipment will affect millions of Nigerians, including your loved ones. Remember that national assets belong to all of us, hence the need to protect them. Report all cases of suspicious movement around electrical facilities to security agencies. When you see something, say something. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and National Orientation in collaboration with the National Counter-Terrorism Center, NCTC, Office of the National Security Advisor. Meet lovebirds Jayola and Adama Davies. Their dream of living together as man and wife has finally been fulfilled. The latest couple in town, Yay! Mr. and Mrs. Jaya Davies! <laughs> but an invasion by their troublesome families was not a scenario they bargained for. Her mother moves in. His mother shows up with his little niece. Then her younger sister joins the scramble. You want to? You want to stay? Married life suddenly becomes very complicated even before it started. Follow their story on this channel as they confront every challenge as it comes. Family forever. The story of our life. You have to move from the point where you protect and defend your religion to a point where you also recognize the rights of the other person, of the other religion, and protect it. So if I am protecting my own territory and my own people and trying to emphasize their rights and protect their rights, I should also be thinking about how to protect the rights of the others. Both Islam and Christianity recognize and defer to God and both recognize the temporariness of the life of this world and that ultimately we all go back to God for the day of reckoning when everybody will render an account of his life on this temporary abode. Welcome back. It's still good morning. Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA and we're still uh, discussing the Edo State uh, governorship uh, election uh, which which is scheduled to hold in September and our guests are still very much with us. So I'd like uh, to uh, get back to Jide Ujo now and uh, you know find out what he thinks we could do better. I'm asking this because um, you know a few days ago like I was sharing with Victor I had some people conversing about the Edo election. They said, well, you cannot have a Edo election without violence. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they go hand in hand. How can we get to a point where we're talking election and not talking violence? 
Well, we can do, but everybody along the electoral value chain needs to behave themselves. Uh, it starts with the professionalism of the, uh, the security agencies. The DSS has the intelligence, and they should be able, by now, there should have been all spot mapping to know and mop up all the arms and ammunition and the miscreants that are being used as cannon folders by politicians. That's what intelligence will have done. Civil society organizations are already doing their own mapping. I told you the uh, Kimpact Development Initiative, what they have even done, apart from tracking electoral violence incidents, is that they have also established a small committee that will mediate uh, you know, issues around conflict or you know, uh, disagreement before it will blow into violence. And also dialogue with the gladiators you know, at the state level before the National Peace Committee will get people to sign peace accord. But you see, the peace accord, we, if you look at the utility value of that peace accord, it has really not, uh, maybe the back channel communication has worked better than the, uh, the optics of just signing. Because people just sign, they, they, they don't believe in the letter and spirit of what they are signing. So the professionalism of the security agencies at this point is highly necessary for them to do the needful. They know the black spots. They, 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 they should have by now done their own uh, uh, mapping uh, of all spots. The, if they have not, they can work in collaboration with civil society organizations like Yaga Africa, like CDD, like KDI. There are several organizations that are in Edo, you know, ahead of election, monitoring one thing or the other. Uh, and then we need peace education. I think my sister, engineer Faith in Wadishi, alluded to that. Peace education is very important. I, I don't think it's, it sinks well to have the narrative that you cannot have a due election without violence. Uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, nomenclature is that? That means uh, we feel that it's a new normal for election to be violent in Edo or uh, anywhere it's sold in. And we can change that narrative even if it has been there. I uh, earlier explained that there are different levels of uh, violence. Uh, we have psychological, we have, uh, you know, uh, social, social and, and then we have the physical. And then before issues we get to the physical, which is the one that we usually count, we need to deal with the rhetorics. And that's where... You know, even the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission also have a role to play. When they are hearing the campaigns and somebody is making inflammatory statements, uh, it, 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 that, that kind of station should, should know that they need to let whoever is their clients know that there will be penalty on the part of uh, the regulators against them if they make such inflammatory uh, rhetorics on their platform. And that's why NBC over the years have come out on media stations that have uh, not checkmated uh, no, the use of fake news, mis misinformation, disinformation, and hate speeches. So uh, this is pre-election season. What, what, what I, uh, uh, the media, what we are doing now is also part of peace education. We are also telling the people Vote not fight. It's not worth it. Um, you won't see the children of the gladiators on the campaign trails. At the very best, you only see their spouse at the grand finale. And they will have maximum security around them. It is the children of nobody that they will give 5,000, 2,000. They will want to go and destroy b uh, commit all manner of infractions. But like Dr. Layuko said in his earlier comment when we started this program, the question we should ask is, what are the deterrents that has been, that we can lay claim to, that has happened? In 20, 
20, when this election happened in Edo, people were apprehended for committing electoral violence. How many have been successfully prosecuted? We had a general election last year. It was uh, conducted in Edo. People were ar uh, arrested. How many have been successfully prosecuted? The moment you allow culture of impunity, it's an incitement to crime. Every criminal-minded person will go into a criminal venture if he knows he will get away with it. But when you know that the chances of your being brought to book or justice is high, you will think twice and you find something else to do. Even if anybody is luring you with 50,000, 100,000 to go and commit an electoral offense, you will ask that person, why don't you send your Peking go do her? You understand? But because there has not been any deterrent, the, the culture of impunity has continued to soar. And people lay claim, look, we have federal might. And this one will say, we have state might. So who has, it's not a flexing of muscle between federal and state might. Mm. But the point is, if whether you have federal might behind you or you have state might behind you, if you are caught and you are investigated, prosecuted, and your name face is splashed on the pages of newspaper is reported across the media spectrum. You would think twice because impunity breeds violence. It's, it's what, has, what the incentives have been over the years. So the, all the critical stakeholders from security agencies, the civil society, the media, the INEC itself must not also promote violence. How? By being transparent and accountable. Because right. lack of professionalism on the part of INEC can also breed violence. Okay. Uh, when they say this is how we want to conduct this election, or election will start at 8 and then 12, 1, 2 p.m. People have not seen poll officials. They will become restive. And that's when you see people going violent. So, INEC itself must behave and, and operate according to the rules. The political class have code of conduct for themselves, which they have given unto themselves. Dr. Layoko knows about that. So, they must believe in the letter and spirit of that code of conduct, and any act of disobedience at the IPAC level, such parties should be sanctioned. That, that they, when the impunity is not broken. Even when you don't break that culture of impunity, is how uh, violence By will way, continue uh, to By the way, the governor of Edo State, uh, Gordon Obaseki, has said that lack of free uh, and fair election in this uh, um, September 21 election will trigger a national crisis. He said that some few hours ago. Uh, Faith Wandishi, how would you want to react to that statement by the, by, the, by the governor and looking at what has played out, knowing that uh, his political party has not been free uh, from some of the actions that has led to violence and some of the uh, negatives that we've seen in the build-up to this election? I, I, I think that, um, I'll, I'll just so that, say that those in glass houses should not throw stones. <laughs> exactly. Because if, um, so what is your own um, um, investment or commitment towards having a free and fair election because you need to look at it from home you cannot give what you don't have and for me that's for me uh, defines an insightful statement that should be investigated i know that the governor he's still governor so he's protected he cannot uh, be investigated he cannot be prosecuted but again some of these statements are statements that we don't expect from political leaders because when you say that if there's no free and fair election, free and fair election in your own definition, when leading to the election, you have not done free and fair actions that will give the environment for a free and fair election. So it is important that political leaders in giving this, making these statements also give solutions or what they have put in place to ensure that these things do, uh, don't happen. We have all agreed here, and I'm so happy that we have the IPAC uh, representative here. We have all agreed, like the 
the weakest link in our electoral value chain is actually the political class. If they look at their, their constitution and they obey their constitution, they look at their code of conduct and they do it properly, there's proper internal party democracy, then you'd have laid the foundation for the general election that will come. But in a situation whereby you have party leaders, you know, beating drums of war, going into election, making insightful statements without solutions, without looking at what is it that we are doing. If the, the, the governor had said, okay, the, 20, uh, the election in September, if it's not free and fair, having done this as a party, having done this as a governor, having put all of these things in place, this is going to happen. Then you begin to say, okay, on your part, you have done that. But when you have not done anything but just incite the people, it shows that the political class is still going ahead with the same uh, kind of uh, uh, elections that we have always had. The only difference right now is that we no longer have political parties who would use uh, palm kernel to thumb print uh, ballot papers, <laughs> who will stuff uh, ballot boxes and all of that. We are now seeing progression in the processes and the reforms that we are having. But in the methodology that the political parties are engaging for the election, we don't see any reforms in that. All right. Uh, Fitwadishi, thank you very much for your comments. Let, let me now ask Dr. Layoko because um, Gideo Joe has alluded to it. Faith has done the same thing. What exactly is the role of political parties? in mitigating violence? The role is very, very important. Because as far as Nigeria is concerned, you cannot be a candidate or contest election except you are sponsored by a political party. Mm -hmm. Because the condition has not allowed for independent uh, candidacy. So political parties have a very important role to play. But unfortunately, like uh, it's an open secret, Political parties always draw up a code of conduct. They draw up a constitution. They draw up a manifesto. But unfortunately, by the time they are coming up with their candidates, they put those things aside. And that is why you see people going to court. At the level of, of IPAC, because IPAC, you know, is like an umbrella body mm -hmm. of all the registered political parties in Nigeria. We, we use it as a way of, okay, talking to ourselves. Like uh, Dr. Jude just said, we have a code of conduct. It was launched about uh, three, at least upgraded about uh, three months ago or five months ago. <coughs> Interestingly, Dr. Jude Ojo was there while these things were built, upgraded and updated. But unfortunately, you see human beings by our nature. The mind of a human being is uh, desperately wicked. Even when you have the rules, some people will still want to bypass. That is why the statement by the governor should not be taken on this face value. Because election is an investment in Nigeria. Dr. Gido Joe gave us the breakdown. It's a serious investment. You have done everything you needed to, to have done on the day of election. Polls will open by 8 o'clock while elections are going on. A, 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 an election resource sheet had been filled and is flying about mm. 11 o'clock mm. when polls have not closed whether we like it or not it is going to gender violence because some people have hinted their hope on oh, finally we are going to get a deliverance and somebody is now show you to, to churching them it is that it is in the nature of human being so that is why it is very very necessary that the first step to avoid violence in, in, the, in the election, free and fair election. Let everybody, politicians, security agencies, INEC, play according to the rules. That one is very, very key. What about disincentivizing uh, politics altogether, political office? Because you have just said, you talked about deliverance. What if there is no deliverance to look at? Yeah, but I, according, to, to according to the concern well? of Nigeria, it is only by election you can change the government. There is no other means. So whether you elected this man and he failed to fulfill his promise, it is still going through the election you can change him. Mm. And get deliverance. And that is it, until you get somebody that will give it to you. All right, so right. we cannot ch change the system and expect that things will work out through. It's not Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olayoko. Uh, Dr. Jideoju. Uh, <laughs> I think you have to get this doctorate. <laughs> no, I, I welcome any honorary. 
I'm too old to go back to school. As we wrap up this conversation, some people have tagged the Edo election as a rematch between Tinubu and Obaseki. Mm. Uh, you know, I want to know whether you look at it in that way. And what do you think Edo people can do uh, to make sure that uh, come September 21, uh, it will be the candidate of their choice and not a candidate of uh, any of these two parties, uh, you know, that eventually wins today? Larry, history beckons. History beckons. You see, that's why I alluded to federal might and state it's might. Right. Uh, whether it's a rematch, I, I don't see, in, in, the, in the strict sense of the word, will, are we going to say it's a rematch? Yes, the president himself has said he wants to win a do. Uh, APC national chairman said they want a do back in the APC fold. But they are the ones that push Edo out. Edo didn't want to leave. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, in 2020, uh, uh, Obaseki had to meet with Buhari and explain to him that he has no choice but to leave APC because Oshomale denied him ticket. And we know that history, how Izeyamu was brought in, and how Obaseki was alleged not to have academic qualification after he had served as four, <laughs> four years as a governor. <laughs> so this shenanigans is what really led Edo to lose, I mean, uh, APC to lose Edo State. But um, the chances of the three frontline candidates are, are bright. It is Edo people who should shine their eyes mm. and determine. You know, there was a saying in 2020, I do not be Lagos. Lagos. Eh, Baba Lagos is not in Abuja, so maybe I do not be Abuja, I don't know. <laughs> but it's all in the hands of the people of Edo State. They don't suffer food so easily. Edo has a very rich history. Uh, Oba of Aranwe, Nogbaisi, we knew how he stood against the colonial masters. Even at the, uh, uh, at the peril of his own life, uh, we knew how the Oba of Benin stood against the Portuguese merchants, you know, who were trying to control the palm oil trade and, the, and all of that. So there is that history behind that they don't, Edo people don't suffer food easily. But I just want them to be dispassionate. I, I don't want to join the rhetorics of. Uh, uh, whether this is a rematch or it's, uh, it's like what we were saying a few days ago before Joe Biden quit, the <laughs> before Joe Biden stepped aside that it was going to be a rematch of 2020. Mm -hmm. But now it's, uh, we, yeah, we are not too sure who, who Trump will be spanning with in the Democratic Party. So 24 hours is a lot of time. I think it's just the projections. What is very key is peace. We must continue to pick priests. And here I will bring in our religious leaders as well as our you know, uh, traditional rulers. The religious institution in Edo is also very strong. The Christian faith, the Muslim, the traditional institution, they are very strong in Edo. Whatever, by whatever they believe in, let the religious leader also lead the campaign as they talk to the people to promote peace. Because without peace, there cannot be development. When you destroy public utility in the name of uh, exhibiting your grievances about the outcome of election, it doesn't work. Look, we have, and, and, and before we, I don't want us to also run away with the castigation of judiciary. Judiciary has also been a savior of this democracy that we are celebrating today. If not for the judiciary, the off-circle election that we are having, including Nedo, will not have happened. You know, the Osaranwe, well, uh, Osubo, and uh, Oshomale, it, it, it will not have happened if know, not Joe, for the we'll, judiciary. We'll have that to put you on hold here because we've run completely out of time. I, I understand we just have about a minute uh, for Faith Wadishi to uh, give us her concluding remarks. Just a minute. So um, I just call on the Edo people, especially the women, to take the front seat and ensure that the next uh, election in Edo is a peaceful one. 
Thank so. you very much, uh, Faith. Uh, we do appreciate you for coming. Executive Director, Center for Transparency, Advocacy, thank you for your time and your thank insight you for on the program. Me. Uh, GD Ojo, maybe I should say Dr. GD Ojo, <laughs> public affairs analyst. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Let it stay <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh, for being our guest again this morning. And of course, Dr. Dikwa uh, Olayo Kong. You can take him to court. You're <laughs> <laughs> <a> very good <laughs> friends. <laughs> Inter-Party Advisory Council, IPAC Deputy National Chairman. Thank you for being our guest. It's we a, appreciate it's a, it's you. A pleasure. Thank All you. All right, so that's good morning, Nigeria, today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ian Ray John. Remain tuned to the NTA. All right, and I'm Victor, so thank you for watching, and we'll see you again tomorrow.